welcome to Essential Ingredients, powered by Next Gen Purpose. EI serves up thoughtful conversations with industry leaders and pioneers who support a regenerative future for our food system. The stories shared by our guests are meant to spark curiosity and inspire informed global change. Good morning and welcome to Essential Ingredients. I'm your host, Justine Reichman. With me today is Danny Nierenberg, co-founder and president of Food Tank. Welcome, Danny. So nice to be here. Thanks for having me. I'm so pleased to have you. I am glad that we are able to connect and I'm so excited to get an opportunity to hear from you a little bit about what you're doing and Food Tank. So, Thank you. Yeah, so let's just jump in. So for those listeners and viewers that are listening to us today and that are not familiar with Food Tank, can you tell us a little bit about Food Tank? Sure, so <clears throat> Food Tank has this very simple mission, which is to highlight stories of a hope and success in, in food and agriculture systems so we can motivate and activate people to make change. We feel that, you know, if you hear something inspiring, it's much more likely to have you take action than if you hear something that's doomy and gloomy. I think that's a great mission. That's a great mission. And what inspired you to start Food Tank? Um, so my co-founder and I were working at an environmental think tank in DC, um, and I'd always done a lot of, you know, I've, I've traveled my whole career. I um, uh, started looking at um, issues around gender and population. I was a Peace Corps volunteer. I, I studied the, the growth of factory farming around the world. I've been to more slaughterhouses and processing plants than anyone should ever go into um, and, and, and in the global south and also in the United States. But, you know, really looking at um, what, what was happening around the world. And so um, at one point during um, my stint at this environmental organization, uh, we had a grant to study agricultural innovation very broadly. And so we spent about 18 months uh, uh, on the continent of Africa. We visited uh, about half the continent, 25 countries. And um, this was uh, around the time of the food and financial crisis. And so things were, you know, not great in, in a lot of places in the world. And, and you know, while we certainly saw a lot of, of um, you know, terrible things around hunger and malnutrition and, and farmers really having a tough time, I also saw incredible stories of, of people and organizations and, and research institutions and others who were really making a difference. And, and it just, you know, the, the, the environmental organization I worked for really focused on the problems. And, and I know we have to understand the problems to come up with solutions. But what I was seeing were, were these, again, these really hopeful, hopeful things happening, you know, women, gr women's groups doing things in, in Ghana and, you know, um, uh, you know, youth leaders doing things in Niger and, and elsewhere. And I wanted to, to sort of switch the paradigm where we talk about what's, what's hopeful and what the solutions are, and then, you know, talk about the problems, because I, I just think that that grabs people more. So um, either very, very, um, I, it was kind of dumb at the time. We we quit our jobs and, and um, I, my co-founder ran up his credit cards and I used all my vacation money that I had accrued at this organization <laughs> and we started Food Tank. And, and that was about nine years ago. And and it's you know evolved into uh, a, an organization where we have a really robust news website where we're publishing stories from around the world, you know, seven days a week, week 365 days a year. Um, we uh, publish books and reports. Our first book came out a few years ago called Nourished Planet. Um, we've published reports on things like true cost accounting in the food system, which sounds really nerdy, but it's a, really a way to like look at how, you know, we price food and, and cheap food isn't really cheap. And, um, and we also do a lot of convening. We have summits and, you know, even during the pandemic, uh, for the first six months of the pandemic, I interviewed maybe 300 experts from around the world. We did live streams every day, just getting their thoughts on what was happening. You know, everyone from like the chief economist at the UN Food and Agriculture Organization to farmers market managers in places like Minneapolis, just seeing how they were pivoting and, you know, talking to people like, you know, Chef Dan Barber and then, you know, women farmers in Kenya and seeing what, the, you know, all of these really inspiring ways that people were getting food to, you know, to their communities or, or making changes or talking about, you know, going from big global food systems to regionalized and localized food systems. So it was really, really inspiring. And now, now we're back on the road again, and we've had um, three food tank summits this year as part of our Nourishing the uh, America tour. 
Um, the first uh, was at Houston Tillotson University as part of South by Southwest in Austin in March. And then we had a, a really um, great um, uh, uh, summit with Spelman College uh, around women leaders in, in technology and food systems, and that was great. And then just uh, last week, we had our DC summit with um, the University of District of Columbia on urban agriculture. So it's been a really like great kickoff to to being back in person and and seeing you know how how organizations and institutions have really coped with the pandemic, and uh you know, there's, there's obviously been a lot of, you know, the, I don't have to tell you, there's been a lot of suffering and, and, you know, we all know that the industry, the, the restaurant industry has been, you know, one of the, the hardest hit and workers have been really hard hit, but I'm also seeing so many like interesting ways that people are pivoting again. And it's just, it's so interesting to watch and to, to be a, like a really small part of it and, and, and help publicize those stories. Well, I think that, I mean, just from listening to you to, from, the beginning when you started nine years ago, amazing. You're like, okay, I'm gonna quit my job. I'm gonna take my money and we're gonna do this, which, you know, a lot of entrepreneurs, there are those entrepreneurs that come and they're like, okay, I got my plan. I got my business plan. I mean, that wasn't me either. <laughs> you know, mine was like an accident. Mine was like, I came up with an idea. I started in Mexico city. I was gonna help families. You know, it was kind of like, it was an accident that turned into something more and was very mission driven, very much like yours, yeah. uh, right? Yeah. Um, and, and to me, those are some of the greatest stories and the most inspirational. So I love hearing that from you, but you really have been on purpose from day one. And you, from the way that you tell this story, you've grown and you, I mean, every step of the way and even through the pandemic and then after you've come out, with huge successes and huge amounts of events and things that are coming through when people are really, you know, they, they don't know how to come through COVID. They don't know how to come back together and people yeah. are still trying to navigate that. Yeah. How did you know when to come back together? Because it was a hard decision, right? I mean, it was scary, right? Because it was, I mean, we we started off in Texas, you know, and like, oh, right. like and, and granted it was South by Southwest, it's Austin, right. which is very different than the rest of Texas. But we just decided to, and we, you know, we were as careful as we could be, but there were, you know, South by didn't require um, anybody to show vaccinations, they didn't require people to, to, um, to mask and, and that's, you know, their, their decision, but, uh, I think it was just, it was the right time. Um, you know, it was, it was before the, these crazy, this crazy variant that now is getting everybody in New York and, and Philadelphia and, and Baltimore where I live. But I, you know, I think, um, it's time we have to learn, you know, I, I, I just think back to what, you know, I've, I've heard um, Dr. Fauci say during all this, eventually we have to get back to, to normal. We have to be careful, but we have to get back to some sort of normality where this is, you know, seen as something we just deal with, like the flu. And, and if people are careful and people get vaccinated <laughs> and people do the things that I, I hope that they'll do, then we, we can get through this. Um, but I think it was important for us as part of you know of, of the food movement we're a very small part of it but it's just, we all have we all thrive i mean i'm sure you do thrive off seeing other people and especially after these two years it was just so exciting to see people we've all aged a little bit but it was so exciting to see people that you haven't seen in two and a half years and and to you know commend them on what they've been doing because again there are so many organizations that have just like come through this and 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 excelled and 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 helped so many people we were talking about our friend Stephen Ritz and I remember talking to him at the very beginning of the pandemic where he was still going to work every day and still making sure that kids in his students and, and their families got fed and he pivoted in so many ways. So like, you know, it, it's, it's, uh, it's and time he, to get back together. And you've seen him, like I've watched Steve Ritz and you see his, you know, his Instagram and his LinkedIn, and he's been traveling around the world to make his, you know, mission and his program, you know, known and continuing to educate people. And he was one of the first people that I saw starting to get back out there. Yeah. Yeah, he's an inspiration and he's very careful. I just, you know, hung out with him at a meeting in, in New York last week. He was masked and he, but he hugging everybody and, and right. making sure, you know, that, that his, his story is told and heard. 
Yeah, no, it's great. Um, and I think it's important to share those things with people because it is scary to get back out there in this time. And the, the education and the communication and the collaboration is all part of it. Absolutely. It's hard to do when we're so isolated and we've tried, right? It's not that things did not continue to happen, right? But it's just, it, it's hard to do in a silo and it's hard to do when we're not collaborating together. And it's just the energy that we feed off of. And I hate to use that word energy, right? I feel like I moved from New York to California, that word energy. No, no. <laughs> but you but know what I mean, right? So when true. I say I, that. I feed off hearing uh, other people. I also, uh, this is something that I, I just recently discovered at a meeting. I get frustrated and I hadn't felt that sort of frustration. Frustration is kind of what fuels me, right? Like hearing from some corporate executives who I will not name and how, you know, what they think are, you know, <laughs> their their views of workers and in, 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 in the food system. I, I, some anger happened and some frustration happened. And I was like, oh, I'm back. <laughs> Somebody said to me, uh, they wrote me afterwards because they, they heard this conversation. They were like, it was nice to see that little Danny spark. And I'm like, yeah, I've kind of missed that because I do get frustrated at long meetings and I get frustrated by people who think they know what they're talking about. <laughs> and it was like, nice to be a little bit like, you know, pumped up again. Yeah, I would agree. You need to have that 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 back and forth, that, that the dichotomy between people's experiences and opinions. Right. And it's it's sort of when you're in person, it's different the relationship between people. Right. Versus when you're over Zoom or just over the phone. Right. Zoom is very polite and not that I wasn't polite. I mean, I might have not been as polite as I should have been, but like, you know, this is all very polite, but you can get into a kind of a little heated exchange with people when you're in person and that's great. You know, you know, not that you're, you know, throwing punches or anything, but I, I'm not going to listen to BS from, from corporate folks who think they know everything. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And, and especially when it comes to workers, workers have had such a hard time, you know, and I'm not going to name the, 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 the chain that, um, uh, I talked to you, but it's, it's a place where a lot of people get coffee and, and I've heard, I've personally interviewed workers from that, you know, who've been fired because they tried to organize or who, you know, they worked with other, um, workers who had COVID during the pandemic, or they've been assaulted by frustrated customers. And, you know, and like, you can't tell me that, you know, their lives are just full of roses and, and, you know, butterflies when they've been through so much these last two years and even before then. Yeah, I would agree. So I want to get back a little bit to the inspiration and some of the stories that inspired you to start Food Tank. Can you share a couple of those? Yeah, I remember um, I was in India and um, I visited this um, organic farm that was run by the Self-Employed Women's Association. It's called Sewa. It's actually the biggest um, workers union in the, in the world uh, with more than a million members and it's all women. And some of them, um, you know, had started this, this organic farm um, to grow things like rice and herbs and, and other things. And then um, work with women in urban settings to sell them under the Sewa label, right? Um, and these were higher quality products, but they were still being sold at a reasonable price. So, you know, like poor folks often get the worst food, right? So they're trying to change that paradigm. But I remember sitting with these women and like they, they had just fed me and, you know, I carry a notebook everywhere, right? And I'm like scribbling things and blah, blah, blah. And so I had finished asking them questions and, you know, getting it translated back to me. And then they like sort of turned it on me. They like wanted to know because they knew I had spent a lot of time in Sub-Saharan Africa, Africa. And they're like, what do people do there? And how are they dealing with like climate change? And how do they deal with pests on their farms? And it was just this like really wonderful opportunity to share like what food tank has learned and it's that 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 sharing you know for that south to south sharing that i think is so important and i think the south to north you know learning like we have so much to learn from from farmers and other parts of the world who have been dealing with you know climate change or you know accepting that they're dealing with climate change for much longer than farmers here and i i feel like there's so much we can learn from farmers and and other 
parts of the world. So that was one of the, the things it was, it was not like, Oh, a, this big epiphany moment. I rarely have those, but just like looking back and I'm like, Oh, that's why, that's why I exist. That's why I do what I do. And, um, yeah, I'll, I'll just stop there. But it was one of those moments where you're just like, Oh, this, this is what it's all about. So what was it like when you realized and you heard those stories to go from there to starting food tank? I think it was like a little bit like what I said before, like, I don't want to be so doom and gloom. That does not motivate people. It What motivates people is hearing stories like that one, or I hope it does. Right. Yeah. Motiv you know, I, I it was, it was like, Hey, we have to do something different here. This isn't working. Like right. this was a different, you know, I was, I was nine years younger and <laughs> I, I, you know, I think, um, it was, you know, it, there, it was a point in my life where I'm like, I can either keep doing this and sort of treading water or, you know, and I, I also have to say that I kind of reached where I was going to reach at this organization. You know, I was never going to move up into anything else. And I, that's a whole different conversation. What were you doing before this? I worked at an environmental organization. I was the director of our food and agriculture program, but that was going to be it for me. A little right. bit of an old boys club, right? Okay. And, um, I wanted, you know, not that I wanted to be like the podcaster I am now or the moderator I am now. I didn't even think of those things. I just wanted to do something different that that motivated me. I, I think I was becoming, you know, sort of um, not as excited. And I, th what I've discovered over these last nine years is that I need to be excited. I need to be, you know, we were talking about that energy before and it's not frou frou -y. It's not you know um new agey you need that energy to just keep going to keep going so, to wake up in the morning to continue on your mission yeah. and your, your day yeah i mean i feel like you have that too that just like you need to be excited you need to be like a little hyped up and and so that's i think that's where food tank you know sort of was born out of and we we wanted to start something that was really just different and i think at that time especially there was a gap right it was either like environmental organizations or food organizations and now what you're seeing is that environmental organizations are embracing agriculture and embracing food because they see it as part of the solution and that's what i want people to come away with that food is the solution to some of our most pressing environmental and social problems whether it's you know cl the climate crisis or workers rights or any of these things food and agriculture can be part of the solution if we get it right and and the urgency of getting it right is greater than ever before. You know, I was talking to Julia Collins, um, the 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 leader of Planet Forward, um, which is, is a helps companies become carbon neutral. And she's like, we have less than a hundred months to turn this around. You know, right. the climate crisis. Yeah. And like, if you think of it that way, it's just like, you can either be like, oh, okay, it's over, right. or you can be like. We have a hundred months to do this and we can because human ingenuity is so great and like people like her inspire me because she said she's like we have a hundred months but we can do it and i you know that that's the thing we can and i think it's also about bringing together the people with all this different information to be able to inspire all this all these other people that have so many resources and an interest so that we can really collaborate and figure this out together because there's so much information out there with so and so many different people have so many different interests but if we can pull all these different people pull all the different information and work together we can hopefully do that because absolutely we can fix it you know it's all about you know i'd love to coin this phrase that my mother said to me as i was growing up you know, get everyone, surround yourself with the, the experts around you that you need to be able to solve problems, right? And I think Absolutely. it's so true because we can't know everything. No, and that, that, yeah, that interaction is key. And it goes back to what we were talking about. We need to be around one another to come up with those solutions. It, it's a group effort. It really is. It takes a village, as they like to say. It takes a village. For sure. <clears throat> so you came up with this idea to do food tank. It's, it's energized by every part of your being from what I can see. And I, I totally, you know, I have no I'm, hobbies. <laughs> no, 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 this is, I mean, I mean, for me, everything that I do is everything that I love. So it becomes right. my mission, my hobby, everything aside right. from my house, which I just moved into in July. So nice. Congratulations. <laughs> and my dogs. <laughs> you know. 
I hope they're feeling better. <laughs> I hope so too. So far, they seem to be keeping the food down. So, <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> but in the meantime, um, so with all that, I mean, I would ask you what you know, what's what's next for you. But it sounds like the next hundred months are what's next. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, kind of. I think for all of us, though, like, I think, um, you know, you've been talking about like this collaboration, we all need to get behind this. And like, I think the last, you know, five years, we, we should this, especially in the United States, it showed how divided we were. But I, I think we have this opportunity now. And again, it goes back to the urgency. <laughs> we have an opportunity because of the urgency now to come together. And, and, and there's, there's, I think a lot of, um, a lot of joy in that. And I think when we talk about these issues, sometimes we forget that there's joy in, 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 in this kind of work. There's joy in, in food. There's joy in, in, um, in, in, in telling stories and, and being a storyteller. Um, and it doesn't have to be so depressing. We can, we can figure this out, but we just need to get it together. <laughs> I would agree. I have, you know, the other question I have for you, and I don't know what you're thoughts are on this is so often we're trying to solve the problem at the, you know, at the, at the consumer level. And then other times, you know, you're, you're talking to researchers and we really need to solve it at the farmer's level because there's a lot of problems at the farmer's level, you know, all this wasted crop, right? And there's, there's really a lack of education around that. Absolutely. And I just, you know, I wonder what your perspective is on that, because I think that there's a lack of information about it, and the numbers are staggering when you think sure. about that. So, I mean, I know that we need to, to work on it at both ends, but I think that people don't realize the challenges at the farmers, at the farmer level. Absolutely. I think people underestimate the challenges farmers face in a lot of different areas. Food, food loss and food waste is certainly one, and often, you know, it's it has, you know, farmers are, are, you know, burying crops instead of selling them because they look a little wonky or they look a little bit, you know, like not some, you know, they look a little bit imperfect. And I think there's all that education around, you know, eating ugly food and, you know, em embracing that. Um, we've talked about it for about 10 years and, and people still want the perfect looking carrot at the grocery store and they want the best looking apple and that's got to change. And so that farmers can, can, um, you know, address those challenges because it's otherwise we're just, we're, I, it, it, it kills me that, that we, we don't give farmers enough credit and that we, you know, they put so much love and labor into the food that they're, they're growing and then they don't get credit for it or they're blamed for it. You know, at the beginning of the pandemic, when you, there are all those supply chain disruptions and you saw farmers just sort of being forced to, to toss food away, that wasn't their fault. That was, uh, those were policy decisions and, and other decisions made long before the pandemic. And, and, you know, that these are systemic changes that need to happen. It's like what we've seen with racial injustice in this country, there are policies in place for centuries that have led to where we are today. And those things need to be changed. And the same goes for farmers and subsidies and loans and the things that they've been locked into. And so, you know, farmers um, need to gain back their power. And, and, and I think that's going to happen soon because they are the solution to so many of the things that we've been talking about. Yeah, I hope so. I hope so, because I think that it's really, it's not talked about enough. I think people focus on the chat, the, the way that we can solve the problem, but I think there's a greater problem at the farmer level that I hope we can solve um, because I think that's going to really hopefully um, give us a greater chance at solving this problem in the next hundred months. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Um, so, you know, what's on your agenda uh, on a personal level for Food Tank in the next few years? Any new, you know, content that you're putting out? Any big changes? One of the things that my um, uh, my uh, co-founder Bernie Pollock and I have done is is start the, what we call a chief sustainability officer group, and it's made up of you know chief sustainability officers from small, medium, and large companies, but also CEOs and founders, and you know there's startups there too. But it's really been this opportunity to hear from companies what their greatest challenges are, whether it's like around packaging or or you know. Um, how they they create awareness uh, around labeling to consumers, that kind of thing. But it's been this really 
awesome opportunity to really hear from companies. And I, I swear, if you'd asked me 15 or 20 years ago, if I'd ever be like talking to companies, I would have said, hell no, they're the problem. They're the evil part of the food companies are the worst. And I really feel like, you know, um, my mind, I, I think one of the, the greatest assets we can have as people is the ability to change our minds. And I, I know that the private sector has to be part of the solution. And, and so listening to these companies, you know, some of them are, you know, and I'm not, again, I'm not going to name names. Some of them are big companies who, you know, have people inside them who really want to make big change, but they're, they're fighting against a huge machine. And then you have these mission driven companies who started off doing the right thing. Right. And I think there's a lot of learning that they can, they can, um, you know, have between one another. And it's been really, really interesting to me we started it during the pandemic and we'll eventually be able to meet in person at at places like um expo east and expo west those are the natural food conferences that happen every year but i just think it's so interesting so that that group has really been um i, I think an awesome opportunity to learn um you know f from companies and then you know also they learn from one another and i think they also learn from these guest speakers that we have so sort of you know again trying to change change the paradigm a little bit. Um, we're going to do that with a, an academic working group too, so that, you know, academics who are working in the food and agriculture space can learn from one another. Um, I feel like, you know, they only see each other a couple times a year at conferences and having the opportunity to learn, um, you know, what's out there or share research will, will also be really beneficial. So th those are two of the things I'm interested in right now. Danny, are those groups something that you have to be invited to, or is that something that somebody would apply to, or how would that work? Yeah, I mean, there are about 120 members of the CSO group right now, and um, it's been us asking, you know, in the beginning, and now people are asking us if they can join. So, you know, it's just like writing me an email at danielle at foodtank.com, and we, we set up a call and, and, you know, figure out if it's a good fit. But yeah, it's been really, really exciting to have these companies sort of reach out to us now. Well, I asked because I figure our listeners who are sitting here, you know, or viewers might want to know. Absolutely. Wonderful. Well, Danny, thank you so much for joining us uh, today on the podcast. It was great to have you. Great to learn a little bit about Food Tank. Um, and I'm going to be following along and seeing how we could participate and maybe collaborate in the future so that we can really amplify your story and those of the people that you're participating and collaborating with and sharing their stories even. Justine, I've been a, such a longtime admirer of yours. So thank you oh, for having so me. No, really, thank you so much for the work that you do. And it was really a pleasure to be be part of this um, this podcast. And I, I, again, keep up the great work and, and I hope I get to see you in person. Likewise. I hope we get to like work on something together. I would love that. I would love that. Thank you so much. Thank you. To learn more about these episodes and access show notes, go to nextgenpurpose.com and choose podcast. If you like this episode, head to Apple Podcasts or your favorite platform to subscribe and leave us a review. Visit the Next Gen Purpose YouTube channel to subscribe to our EI videocast and give this episode a like while you're there. Follow us on Instagram and LinkedIn at Next Gen Purpose and connect with me on LinkedIn or Instagram at Justine underscore Reichman. Thanks for joining us.